So the year was 1495, and it was Leonardo da Vinci, that great artist, the creative genius, who set to work on that picture, The Last Supper. And as, as you know, it depicts Jesus and his disciples just hours before Jesus' death. But what many people don't know about this picture is that just a few days earlier, da Vinci had this violent falling out and a confrontation with a fellow painter. And I guess things got so ugly and so bad that da Vinci swore up and down. He said, I'm going to get back at this guy, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to paint him as Judas in my Last Supper painting. <laughs> Now, I, I guess that's kind of how they rolled back then. Um, you didn't want to get on the bad side of one of these artists. Um, I was reading about Michelangelo. Have you guys seen um, the Last Judgment painting? It shows people being tortured in hell. I mean, it's this brutal, brutal picture In the lower right-hand corner, there's this guy just writhing in agony with a snake wrapped around him, biting his backside. Turns out that was one of Michelangelo's enemies. So he's like, I'll get back at you. I'll put you in hell. So <laughs> da Vinci kind of has a close second here, paints the guy as Judas. I mean, how brutal is that? But something interesting happened. He finished with the face of Judas. He then begins to work on the face of Jesus. But when he does that, it was like something was hindering him. Something was frustrating his efforts. Something was holding him back. He couldn't seem to find the inspiration for that moment. And so for days, he's wrestling, what's going on? Why can't I do this? I paint lots of faces. And then God's spirit began to convict him. And he realized, oh, Maybe it's because of what I did with Judas. So he goes back and he blots out the face of Judas, replaces it with just some random guy, and then comes back to Jesus. And of course, this time it was with tremendous success. So it wasn't until da Vinci could blot out the bitterness and the unforgiveness that he had in his heart towards his enemy that he could finish the masterpiece. I love that story because I think in so many ways, it depicts, it typifies what the book of Colossians is all about. You guys know this. Colossians is Paul's message saying, look, God is up to something in this world. He's in the process of painting a masterpiece. His kingdom is breaking out in all of creation. It's the reconciliation of all things. And Paul, in Colossians, he invites us to step into that and says, hey, join what God is doing. But then right in the middle of this book, he pauses and he says, now, there are some things that can hinder, that can mar, that can distort our view of the masterpiece. And one of those things is bitterness and the toxicity of unforgiveness. So we pick it up in verse eight. If you have your Bibles open, check it out. It says, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Now, all of these things are fruits of unforgiveness. So if I'm bitter towards someone, this is what's gonna flow and come from my life. He then, verse 12, contrasts and says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Do you see what Paul's doing here? He's contrasting the grotesque, hideous nature of bitterness with the beauty and the power of forgiveness. And what's really fascinating is I was researching this. One commentator says, you know what? What Paul seems to have in mind here when he uses phrases like dearly beloved or clothe yourself, robe yourself, put on these things, well, he seems to have in mind an image of a Jewish bride who is preparing for her wedding. And so in preparation for that big day, she clothes herself, she gets her makeup ready, she gets her jewelry ready. And what Paul is, seems to be saying here is even as a bride is adorned for her wedding, so we as the bride of Christ are beautified by the virtue of forgiveness. 
And to me, I find that analogy so exciting because when you think about it, is anything more beautiful than forgiveness? I mean, when you experience it, when you see it, when you walk in it, when it happens to you, it's one of those things, well, forgiveness has the ability to take your breath away. It was a few weeks ago, my family and I were driving across the country, heading out here to Portland, and I've always wanted to see the Grand Canyon. And so we're going through Arizona, we stop at the Grand Canyon, and we park there, walk up to the railing, and if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. The moment we see it, it was like, oh, our breath was sucked out of our lungs. I was speechless, and I looked over at my wife, and she actually had tears in her eyes, and then I started singing opera music, and the birds, no, I'm just kidding, um, but it really was one of these moments. It was so beautiful. It was so compelling, and then the icing on the cake, and I know John Mark wouldn't agree with this, but the icing on the cake is that evening, I went down and had a double-double burger at In-N-Out. Um, <laughs> So I got to experience two of America's greatest wonders in a single day, in and out and the Grand Canyon. <laughs> you see, some things are just electric. They pulsate with life. They're riveting. Forgiveness is one of those things. It's like the ballerina. She's dancing in front of thousands and thousands of people, and when she was done, this reporter comes up to her, and he sticks a microphone in her face, and he says, that was stunning. Can you put into words what it was like to dance that? And her response, she said, well, if I could put it into words, I wouldn't have to dance it. Some things are so beautiful, you can only dance it. Paul is arguing when he says, dearly beloved, love, forgive, be clothed in compassion. What he's doing is inviting us to participate in the dance of the kingdom of God. And what is that dance? It is forgiveness. So we see in this text right off the bat in the language that he's using and the way that he's painting on the tapestry of the text that forgiveness is beautiful, but Paul also acknowledges that forgiveness is difficult. And isn't this the truth? Forgiveness is one of the hardest things I think that God's word ever asks us to do. I know for me, it is the issue that I struggle with. You know, Paul begins in verse 12 and 13. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. And I was looking up that phrase, bear with one another. In the Greek language, it can just as easily be translated as endure one another. <laughs> or another way of putting it is put up with one another. In other words, forgiveness is one of the hardest things because you're dealing with people. There's this old hymn that they used to sing in England. It go, went like this. To dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, that's another story. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and Paul's saying there is another story. And the other side to the story is forgiveness is excruciating. It's painful. It's hard. It's difficult. C.S. Lewis, he said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they actually have someone to forgive. And there's so much truth to that. And this is where I struggle. But if you, like me, struggle in this area, imagine how it must have been for Paul's original audience. Keep in mind, Paul is communicating. He's writing this letter to a group of people. They definitely had their own issues of forgiveness. Why? Well, you guys have studied this it was the context of oppressive empire. Caesar Nero was on the throne when this book was written. And by all accounts, secular accounts, Caesar Nero was insane. Or as they say in Oxford, he was off his trolley. Um, his spin cycle was one sock off balance or whatever. So this guy had issues, right? He's vindictive, he's sadistic, he's, he's cruel. He would take Christians and dip them in wax and light them on fire and ride nakedly in his garden, shrieking at the top of his lungs, light of the world, light of the world. He would take them and sew them in the skins of wild animals and then feed them to the beasts. One historian who lived back then, he described Nero this way. He said, Nero was ugly <laughs> with a bull neck, beetle brows, 
flat nose, tough mouth, pot belly, spindly legs, bad skin, and an offensive odor. So this is Nero, right? I mean, not a pleasant guy to be around, not a pleasant guy to smell. There's no wonder the Christians called him the beast. So Paul writes to the Colossians and he says, beloved, forgive, be clothed in compassion. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. These were excruciating words to hear. And brothers and sisters, for all of us, these are excruciating words to hear too. Oh, we don't live under the same kind of political climate, but the fact of the matter is every single one of us this morning, we have reasons and causes to be bitter and unforgiving. We know what it means to have a knife stabbed in the back. We know what it means to have grown up in households that are hurtful or painful. We know what it means to go through abuse or have people turn on us and betray us. We struggle with this area. And, and the temptation for me is to pull a da Vinci, <laughs> to say, right, I'm going to paint that person as Judas in my heart. I'm going to write them off. I'm going to be bitter. And I begin to think about that situation over and over again. I become resentful. In fact, did you know the word resentment means just that, to think again? So I keep thinking about it. I keep picking it up. I go to bed. It's on my mind. I wake up in the morning. It's on my mind. And I might think that my bitterness is a subtle form of revenge. I might think that it's my way of getting back at that person or secretly, subversively hurting that person. But here's the fact of the matter that I've learned painfully that bitterness, the only person it hurts is me. It's kind of the equivalent of drinking poison and expecting the other person to fall down dead. Frederick Buchner, he had this to say, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. <laughs> I think there's truth to that. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel of both pain you are giving and the pain you are getting back, in many ways it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Hebrews 12.15 puts it a little more succinctly. It says this, See that no bitter root grow and cause trouble and defile you. This blew me away a few days ago. I looked up that word defile. It literally means to contaminate or corrupt through disease. It was used in the ancient world to describe people who had leprosy or some incurable condition, the kinds of people that you would stay away from because you didn't want to catch what they had. You see, defilements, this cancerous tumor of bitterness grows from the inside out. And what God's word warns us is that sooner or later, it will affect every area of our life, beginning, I think, with how we relate to God. And I know this to be so. Those times where I've been bitter or unforgiving, it's like, well, with da Vinci, he couldn't see the face of Jesus. Something's happening in my walk with God, and it's like when I pray, my prayers hit the roof and come down, or when I read the Bible, I may as well be reading Webster's Dictionary or something. It's like, what's going on here? You see, it's that defiling root of bitterness that needs to be pulled out if I'm to see Christ again in my life. Another thing that affects is our relationships with others. And this is really surprising because so often I think bitterness is just about me and that person, and I don't think how it can affect my wife. I don't think how it can affect my child. But the reality is, is that I can only keep bitterness hidden for too long. Sooner or later, it's going to erupt. Sooner or later, it will come out in little phrases or ways I act around different people or when I run into them accidentally or whatever. I find that in my heart, it's still there. The pain is still real. And my family and those closest to me and the church community can be affected by that. It's been said before that bitterness is kind of like pregnancy. You can only keep it hidden for so long, <laughs> right? Sooner or later, it will emerge. 
Bitterness defiles, it affects my walk with God. It, it affects how I relate in community. Another interesting thing about um, bitterness I, I found out recently is just how much it affects our own physical health. I, I was reading in this journal a few months ago in England, uh, the Stanford doctor was doing a whole study on bitterness and how it actually affects us physically, psychologically. And he said this, um, carrying around a load of bitterness and anger over how you were treated is very toxic. But letting go of a grudge can slash stress levels up to 50%, improve mood, sleep quality, and overall physical vitality. In fact, many people have lost over 60 pounds. I'm just kidding about the 60 pounds. Just (laughs) threw that in. Um, (laughs) but, But the point is, is that Forgiveness is good for you, right? Forgiveness liberates us to be the kinds of people that God has called us to be. Last week, John Mark taught an epic teaching on on Philippians where Paul says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which lie behind, I press forward to those things which are ahead. Forgiveness is the way that I can press on. Forgiveness is the means by which I can step into the future that God has for me. The story is told of these monks who, they're on their way to another village. And as they're walking, they they see this old woman and she's trying to cross a river. And it was clear that she couldn't do it on her own. So one of the monks, he's like, here, let me help you. We'll, We'll get you across. So one on each side, they lift her up. They take her across the river. They then cross back. Well, she's bone dry, but they're soaking wet. And they continue on with their journey. And one of the monks, he just starts complaining. He's like, of all the luck. I mean, we just had to run into that woman. Now look at my clothes, totally soaking wet. 30 minutes later, he's still going at it. He's like, and and did you notice that old woman, she didn't even say thank you for what what we did. She was so ungrateful. And then an hour later, he's like, now I'm beginning to stink. And he's just doing this hour after hour. And then he turns to his buddy. He's like, now, aren't you upset? He says, no. He says, I put the old woman down five miles ago, but you're still carrying her. (laughs) You see, bitterness means I'm still carrying the old woman or the old man or whatever it may be. Forgiveness is the art of letting them go now. Forgiveness is not so much about changing the past, but it's about changing our future. I don't know about you, but for me, I want a future that I can experience all that God has for me. I don't wanna be hindered. I don't wanna be held back. I wanna run the race that he set before me. And so as I've been wrestling through this, the question that I have is, how does this work? How can I do this? Practically, what what does it mean to forgive? Because we're dealing with heart issues. We're dealing with deep issues. Well, I think the first place to begin is prayer. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44? He says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you and mistreat you. Why does Jesus ask us to pray? Because when we pray, something subversive happens. I invest my time in that person. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So I'm praying for them. I'm praying for that situation. And through the back door, forgiveness is smuggled. (laughs) All of a sudden, I begin to see that person through gospel-shaped lenses. I begin to see them in ways that God sees them. God begins to give me healing, creative, innovative ways to bring reconciliation to that situation. Oh, this was really brought home for me a number of years ago. I had a chance to go to Kosovo, which, as you know, is this war-torn nation. Um, It's like 90% a Muslim. And I was invited to come to the hospital the day before I left and and spend some time with this young man. And I sat there by his bedside. He had been there for three months because he had gotten saved. He had then went back to his Muslim family and he shared with them about the love of Jesus. They turned on him. His brothers stabbed him repeatedly. Miraculously, he was able to get out of the house, rescued, taken to the hospital, this close to dying. Three months later, there he is recovering. And he looks at me. He says, Dominic, can you pray for me? I said, sure. 
what do you want me to pray? He said, tomorrow, I'm hoping to get out. And he says, when I do, the first thing I want to do is go back to my family and I want to tell them about Jesus again. And for me, that's like praying for a death sentence or something. I said, how, how could you do that? I mean, they, they turned on you. And he said, here's how. He said, it all boils down to one word, prayer. I said, what do you mean? He said, these last few months, I've done nothing but pray for them and intercede for them. And God has given me a heart for them like I've never had before. And I really believe that he's calling me to go back. And for some of us, the Lord wants us to go back through the lens of prayer and to lift up that situation to him and to say, God, what do you want me to do? Your word says, as much as depends on me, I'm to live peaceably with all men. So God, how would you resolve this? How would you deal with this? Help me to see them as you see them. Another interesting thing, and I think it's so practical that I see in our text this morning, no, Paul says, Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. And that word forgive, I, I looked it up the other day. Um, in the Greek, it's this word charizomai, which is in the present tense. It means forgive and keep on forgiving. Some things we can get over. Some things, it's water under the bridge. No big deal. I can move on. I let it go. But isn't it true that other things are so painful that for some of us, it's a daily struggle? It's a daily choice we have to make. I'm going to let this go. I'm going to give this to the Lord. I can't hold on to this anymore. Forgive and keep on forgiving. In other words, forgiveness is not a magic bullet. You pull the trigger once and that's it. No, forgiveness is something that we constantly do. It's like air in our lungs. In the kingdom of God, we breathe in forgiveness. We breathe out forgiveness. We receive forgiveness. We then share that forgiveness with others. And this, and maybe you can relate, is where I struggle. Because in my heart, I don't want to keep on forgiving it's so much easier for me just to kind of keep a running tally in my mind of all the things that that person did to me. A friend of mine, he told me a story of this young couple that got married, and it was one of these marriages you wonder, how on earth did they get together? Complete opposites. He was a shy, quiet, introverted accountant. She was this kind of wild, outgoing, noisy cowgirl from Eastern Oregon or something, and, and they get together and they get married. First night back on their honey, off, off of their honeymoon, they're back at his house. They wake up at two in the morning. His dog is barking outside. Well, she gets up out of bed. She opens the window and shouts, that's one, and gets back in bed. And the guy's like, okay. He didn't say anything, you know. He's just a little quiet for that. To, but he thought it was rather strange. A few minutes later, the dog's still barking. She gets out of bed, this time more upset, opens the window. That's two, she yells, gets back in bed. Now, now the guy's starting to get a little nervous. 20 minutes later, the dog's still barking. She gets out of bed. That's three. She grabs the shotgun that she always had in her room, opens the window, shoots the dog, and gets back in bed. Well, at this, the guy's like... Oh becoming unhinged. He's like, I love this dog. I've had this dog for 12 years. Why'd you do that? And he's going on like this. And she sits up and looks at him and says, that's one. <laughs> now there's this verse in the Bible um, that says something like love keeps no record of wrongs, <laughs> right? And for me, that's my struggle. I can be, okay, that's one, that's two. Don't cross me. Here's the line. Don't go any further. And I keep the record of wrongs. Like Peter, he came to Jesus in Matthew 18. He said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Which actually was pretty impressive because the rabbis at that time said the most you would forgive is three times. On the fourth, that's three, you know, you can do whatever you need to do. But they said three times, that's it. So Peter's probably thinking, man, Jesus is going to be impressed with me. I've doubled the rabbis and some. Should I forgive seven times, Lord? And Jesus' response was, no, not seven. But what does he say? Seventy times seven. Now, 490 times. 
insane. Jesus is not saying, okay, keep a notebook in your back pocket. Okay, that's 403. You have 87 more times, and then you're toast. No, what Jesus is saying is forgiveness is part of the rhythm and cadence of our life. It's something we do. It's who we are. It's what it means to be in the kingdom of God. So, so I begin in prayer. I bring that person to the Lord. I pray for the situation. I pray for the mess. I pray for God to give me his perspective. I then understand that forgiveness is not gonna be a one-off thing. It's a discipline. It's intentional. It's ongoing. And then that, I think, brings us to what I think is the most important point of all. I can only forgive when I embrace the fact that I'm forgiven. Isn't it interesting? In our text, Paul says in verse 13, he says, forgive as Christ has forgiven us. So he brings us to the deepest and most fundamental way to forgive by reminding us of what God has done through Jesus' death and resurrection. He says, look, do you want a picture of what it means to forgive? Then look no further to the cross. And when I look to the cross, I see what forgiveness is all about. I learned, first of all, that forgiveness does not necessarily mean ignoring pain, right? Jesus stared the horror of wickedness in the face. We have to come to terms with what they did, with what they said. It's not ignoring it or sweeping it under the rug. When I look to the cross, I realize that forgiveness is costly. His hands and his feet were pierced for your forgiveness. His back was lacerated and torn for forgiveness. They pressed a crown of thorns into his skull for forgiveness. And when he died, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this morning, brothers and sisters, first and foremost, we need to know that we are forgiven. Paul put it this way. He said, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The book of Psalms says he has taken your sin and he has cast it as far as the east is from the west. Jeremiah takes it a step further and says, not only has he forgiven your sin, but he has forgotten it. That blows me away. I can forgive sometimes, <laughs> I struggle with that, but forgetting, that's a whole nother ball game. You know, let's say after the service, Ian Nelson comes up to me and he's like, Dom, that was like the worst teaching on forgiveness I've ever heard. Um, bam, and just punches me in the face and I fall down and it's like ultimate fighter Ian, he's unleashed, you know, he's just going at it, takes me out to Shoals Ferry Road, I'm run over three times and and then six months later, when I wake up out of my coma at the hospital, let's say that Ian has a change of heart, and he's like, oh, I need to go see Dom. So he comes to the hospital. He's like, Dom, and I'm looking at, up at him through bruised face, and he's like, Dom, I don't know what happened to me that day. I forgot my medication or something. <laughs> Will you forgive me, please? Now, in that moment, I might be able to forgive Ian, maybe. <laughs> But I guarantee I would never forget it, right? I mean, every time I see Ian this next year, I kind of flinch, you know? Or if John or Mark asked me to teach again, I'd be like, I don't know. That's the church. They beat you up and throw you on Shoals Ferry Road. You see, forgetting is something I can't do. But check this out. Our God has the gift of forgetfulness. Our God, whose eyes can see through everything, well, there's some things his eyes can't see through. The blood of his son that covers you and me today. You, brothers and sisters, are forgiven. Now freely you have received, freely give. I think of a woman who understood this so well. Her name, Corey Temboom. You know, if you've ever been to the Yad Vashem Memorial in, in Jerusalem, you know that outside they have this row of trees called the Avenue of the Righteous. And each one of those trees is planted in honor of someone who helped the Jewish people during World War II. Corrie Temboom, during World War II, she hid Jews in her homes. 
She, she rescued them, she helped them, and because of that, she was arrested, thrown in a concentration camp, went through unspeakable things. By God's grace, she made it out alive, and when she was done, she determined that the rest of her life would be sharing reconciliation and forgiveness. One Sunday, she's at a church teaching on forgiveness. A guy comes up to her afterwards, holds out his hand and says, will you forgive me? She recognized him. He was one of the guards at the concentration camp. He beat them, he abused them, he visually raped them when they were in their showers. This perverted, messed up guy standing before her. And this is what Corey Ten Boom said of that moment. I stood there with coldness clutching at my heart but I knew that the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. I prayed, Jesus, help me. Woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me and I experienced an incredible thing. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down into my arms. It sprang into our clutched hands and then this warm reconciliation seemed to flood my whole being, bringing me to tears. I forgive you, brother, I cried with my whole heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. The former guard, the former prisoner. I had never known the love of God so intensely as I had in that moment. And then she said this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover the prisoner was you. As we come to the table of communion this morning, is there someone you need to set free? So that you can be unleashed to run the race that God has for you. Is there someone that you've been painting as, in, as Judas in your own heart? And perhaps today is the day the Lord is saying, blot it out, let it go, give it to me. Today, have you been carrying around this weight mile after mile after mile? The Lord invites us to give it to him. Jesus said, come to me when you're weary and heavy laden and you will find rest for your soul. It's like that four-year-old boy who learned the Lord's prayer all wrong. He said, daddy, daddy, I learned the Lord's prayer and here it is and he says it and then he gets to the part about forgiveness. He says, and and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. (laughs) And the daddy's about to correct him. No, 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 it's not trash baskets. But then he thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's onto something, right? Forgiveness, it's taken out the trash bringing it to the cross, crucifying it, laying it down. It's not changing the past, but it's changing your future. May the Lord make application in our life today in Jesus' name.